and, uh, and then, you know, have a bathroom break, and then we'll go back to it. And uh, the movie started, and, you know, I, I was thinking about it from her point of view. She was very moved by it because there was like her whole life was like in front of her, all this footage she'd never seen and these interviews and people from her life talking about it. And, and all, you know, you could tell from looking at it, all the people who worked on the movie, who put all this work into it. And, and, and she was uh, um, very moved, you know, very just reliving all these these moments and it got to be an hour and a half and I hit stop and I said, you know, so we can take a bathroom break. She goes, what are you doing? I went, what? She goes, hit that damn bar again, Let's keep going. And, and we watched it all the way through and, um, and uh, she thanked me. So, um, so she seen, you know, all of it all the way through. Mm. Did she have resistance? Yeah. No, no. Um, we had done these short movies together uh, to promote Blue Nights. <clears throat> Some of that footage in, is in the movie. And uh, I sort of pushed my luck and I said, you know, there's never been a doc, a full length doc about you. Would you let me do one? And she went, uh, okay. And that was it. And she never asked, how's it going? You know, and it took a lot, it took six years, you know, between the money coming and stopping and starting. And, and she never once asked, how's the movie? <laughs> um, it wasn't until it was finished and I showed her that three hour cut, you know, that, that she even knew that I wasn't kidding around. Please wait Pardon for me? the mic. Harrison Ford, did he invest? Yeah. No. God, no. No, I, uh, no um, did Harrison Ford invest in the movie? No, Netflix invested in the movie. Um, uh, Kickstarter got us kickstarted. Uh, we got a, um, <clears throat> when we did the Kickstarter campaign, we did a trailer. And the trailer um, went viral. And um, Netflix and other other companies um, saw it, and and sort of came around, <clears throat> and and really saw that there was a real audience for this movie, and that, uh, and then, from that moment on, we were home free. Then then I could finally, you know, get a staff to edit the movie and 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 do all and use all the footage that I've been shooting these past years. But but Harrison was was a um, a close friend of the uh, of the family for a long time. I have a question. Wait for the microphone, please. Wait for the microphone, please, sir. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> um, Whisper. How collaborative uh, was she in the choice of the readings? Was there much back and forth between you? Um, she really, um, when we were doing the Blue Nights for, for that, we were very collaborative because that was going to be used as a promotional tool for the, uh, f uh, to promote the book. But as far as like her collaboration or input, um, she uh, took the most indifferent stance that she's most famous for. Um, she just was not, um, she sort of, just show it to me when you're finished, I'll be here. Um, it was, uh, um, I, I, I was totally open to notes, there was never any, oh that part makes me uncomfortable, or you should use this, or, um, there were so many, um, you know, while we were, as I was building the story and what I would choose, the, the, the choice of the writing and the prose that I chose uh, to, that ended up in the movie was constantly changing. You know, I ended up <clears throat> using, I ended up kind of shooting just about everything that she wrote 
you know, I, I dealt with her novels. I dealt with many things that didn't end up in the movie. And for those pieces, you know, instead of me going back to Joan, oh, now we're going to add this. Oh, now we're going to add this. I would have other people read it or I'd just figure out what I was going to do with it later. Uh, but as far as, um, you know, what was going to be in it at the end, um, she, she was more just show me. Please wait for the microphone. Hi. Uh, when making the project, uh, what do you think was the most interesting thing that you found out about her that you didn't know in the beginning through the whole process? Well, it, it's really interesting to... Um, from, from the time she said, uh, okay... Um, I immediately reread <clears throat> all of her work um, in, in chronological order. And to do that with someone that you grew up with and that you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a different experience than, than someone you're you know, studying in college or whatever. And um, I guess I didn't... I'd sort of read from the outside. I knew she was the ultimate Californian and the Western Westerner, and from Sacramento. But I actually the the part about the Donner Party and um, and and I never looked at my own relative as really having that kind of frontier spirit. I mean, after finishing her work, I really see her I, I i see her as like I, I see her ancestors in her and i see the strength that she's so famous for i see it on the inside and and uh it, it's not an observation one has about a family member i saw it once i i, I read the work in in totem and and i didn't um i also learned i i'd never picked up on how many daughters there were with with either afflictions or you know being you know fugitives or being you know troubled or just about all the daughters had uh were were experiencing um you know really sort of terrible things um and as john says you know you write to you know, as cautionary tales, you know, as if you can control it. And so much of the, what I think comes across is, is her desire to control or her, her um, quest to control, to, to write, to understand so that she can, uh, you know, maybe have insight about madness and and stuff so all of those things i didn't um um think about before i made this movie but but i did at the end there's no doubt that she was a brilliant writer and you captured that in your brilliant film and i thank you for that um, I'm a writer myself, and I, I could really relate with her on a number of levels. Um, what seemed interesting, my takeaway, I had this metaphor of her being an hourglass, where you pour the sand in at the top, and then it fills the bottom. And then she would come on as another hourglass. There was like a sequence of filling is as I saw it, and she would move from one project to the next, to the next, to the next, which kind of kept her moving forward. But I also felt that, uh, in a way, this her writing was a way of objectifying her life. And the question I have is, it did she have any emotional attachment to her projects? Because it seemed when they were complete, then they were complete, and then she would move on to the next. Uh, well, well, I would imagine, um, you know, uh, um, 
a great deal of emotion in terms of struggle and in whatever she was writing to get it exactly right. Um, um, you know, she she would fret and, you know, Blue Nights, I think, was probably the most difficult thing she ever wrote in her life. Um, and she's she's come across earlier pieces that were that were very very difficult, um, but at the same time she's also, you know, a, a, a workhorse, you know, a, a a journalist who who does go from one story to the next to the next, and um, and recognizes um, moments that are so absurd and tragic as a five-year-old on acid and uh, and is a journalist and also a mother and can divide it down the half and go, that's gold. And I have a two-year-old waiting at home for me. So she's, um, um, you know, that's, that's like her process as far as I can tell. Please wait for the mic. There's yeah, a lot uh, of other people watching this in our overflow space, so we really would like to have this through the microphone system. Thank you. Uh, objective. So, but as a as a journalist, she really did, and again, I do photography as well as a field of journalism. You really have to objectify what you're going on, separate emotions as much as possible to get through it. Because, I mean, when I went to Indy, when I came back, I was looking at my photographs and I was sobbing because when you're immersed in what you're seeing, uh, you can't afford to emotionally get involved with the pain or whatever, you're, or the suffering, so you objectify the experience. But at some point, when you see what you, you went through, then it becomes real. Yeah, well, can't say, yeah. Um, unless I missed it, you didn't um, include that the, the Central Park young kids were exonerated. Was that was that in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I? I, I, know I what she <clears throat> said. I, I used to have a, a banner that they were free, but. Um, I guess at some point I thought maybe that would be implicit, and you know, from the moment she says yeah. it was all a lie, and they were talking about you know yeah. the narrative of the rhetoric, and uh, but yeah, they were certainly, and she, you know, she called that long before anybody. Ah, please wait for the mic. Hi. Um, I know your family and your father, and I knew him very well. Mm. And I'm a writer. And it's probably the best film I've ever seen about being a writer and what, Thank you what so it much. means. Um, there's no question about it. <laughs> and, and I love Joan. And um, you caught, she really is the John Wayne. She is the Western figure. So many of us of her generation who were who were writers, you know, were fighting not to just write little Emily Dickinson, you know, novels, but to really write about our feelings, to go deep inside the stuff you'd never dare to say. And she was the she was the iconic figure for us, and is mm -hmm. her writing. You really, it's a great story of a writing and the process and how one is born not to just be a person, but you're, you, are the, you are the machine. You are constructed to do the writing. Uh, you caught so much and you caught so much of their love story and how attached they were and how astonishing because I remember seeing them together in projection rooms and the way they always sat together and looked at each other. It was, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful film. Griffin. Thank you so much. And there's one. 
I worked with your father many times at Vanity Fair. I was one of his fact checkers. So I'm especially it's all home honored, week here. <laughs> honored to be here. Um, I, how did you choose the people who were the voices? I loved Calvin Trillin especially, but did people volunteer to do this or how did you select them? Well, well that was, that was uh, you know, something I struggled with, <clears throat> with, you know, with, uh, as I would decide, you know, as it got closer and closer to turning in the movie, you know, what exactly the, the, the pros would be that I would choose. Um, you know, I, I didn't, as I said, I didn't want to go back to Joan and go, can you reread this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And then, then I thought, I, I, I seem to have a little repertory of, of current voices. So um, at the, like a week before mixing, I called Calvin, I called... Uh, David and um, uh, Shelley Wanger. That's that's um, for Joan's voice. That that's her editor, and and I uh, got them all to come into a studio and 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 do the readings. It seemed to be the most organic way to do it. Mm, two over here. Hi, Griffin. Um, I wanted to know what your favorite book of hers is. Um, well, I have... Um, I, I think... Um, I think the... the um, well, the White Album was the first one I was old enough to really digest, you know. Um, so that will always stay with me, and 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 I was very, I was a young, I was like twelve when Manson was happening, and and um, so all that feels very very close to me. Um, um, but um, as I, uh, I'd say Central Park is my favorite essay, what you did, uh, uh, Seven Mile Journey, um, and um, Democracy. Um, where she, um, it, it's one of her lesser known books, but there's just something uh, about those characters that that, uh, that really stuck with me that I um, really appreciated when I was making the movie. There's another one there. read the books and in this brilliant movie we see the way she mourns the loss of her great love her husband and then her child not many people get to see their life in front of them in the aging process uh, and it seems with each one of her battles she becomes frailer and frailer and uh, she wears these tragedies does she also mourn the loss of her youth and all that that entails? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know that she sort of thinks like that. Um, I think she, you know, uh, I think she, you know, is in Blue Nights. She, she writes very clearly about about aging, about being suddenly a a a woman walking down uh, a New York City street and being afraid of falling down and and being um, so vulnerable to a city that she grew up in, um, you know. So so I think that she's you know she's I, I think she's very aware of you know her own mortality and. And aging, and as she's aware of it, she, in order to understand what she thinks, as Shelley says, she writes about it. Uh, but I don't know that it's a mourning process. I think it's more an observational process. Hi, Griffin. Um, maybe a silly question, but um, is Joan still writing? Does she still write anything at all? I know that she she's very 
She's very involved in the world. She's got the 24-hour news going on, and then when she's in one room, and then there's a pile of books about the creation of Israel on the other, or whatever she's sort of researching. But I, I, I don't know that she's like actively, you know, writing. Um, uh, there are so many things I, you know, I mourn that, that, you know, I'd love to hear what she would be writing about in this day and age. Um, but um, but I, I, I don't think we're going to find out. And there's one over there, too. Yes, you implied that the daughter was troubled, but you didn't really get into, and Joan said that she wished that she'd been more aware of how troubled she was. Uh, the implication was alcoholism, but it wasn't clear. Did you purposely not? Um, well, I think I think it was, you know, it was alcoholism, and and uh, and uh, she was, um, she you know she was troubled by that, and you know she was adopted. Not that that's relevant one way or another, but but you know there was a section that dealt with her being adopted and and meeting her birth family and um, um, that just sort of went off in a sort of movie unto itself. Um, so there was really, you know, not that much detail I could have I could have done then. Um, you know, just having having um, just having Joan talk about, you know, um, Quintana's struggle with alcoholism, you know, uh, as an interviewer was painful enough for me to get out of, so that was as far as I wanted to go. There's one back there. And there's one. We got you. I see you. Hi, thanks. Hi, I was just curious to know, was she always so expressive with her hands when she talked? I found that fascinating in that interview that you did with her. Yeah, um, if you look at the earlier, uh, this is an observation from someone who's watched this thing for thousands of hours, but um, if you look at her earlier interviews, her hands move a certain radius. And then I think as you as you get older, um, your your younger gestures become more exaggerated, so it's like the 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 hands just get farther, and suddenly you got a hand ballet going. <laughs> and uh, it was um, it, 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 it it's something that it just sort of evolved in her life. Right here, this man. I'd like to sit in on your conversations with her today on the political scene. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think the man in, in, in the White House, uh, he, <clears throat> she doesn't feel he's got the, 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 the kind of uh, genius evil that say a Cheney has. He's just not that fascinating on, on, on a narrative writing level, you know. Um, but it, it, I, I, I think she would be much more drawn to um, trying to understand the nation and as, as Hilton says, the, the, the narrative of the rhetoric. And, and you know, uh, um, while she's not writing about it, that's what she would be writing about, I, I, I think, of trying to understand the divisiveness that, that, that New York City went through uh, during the Central Park. I think she'd, her instincts would be drawn, too, to... Um, and, you know, in, in uh, uh, the, her most recent book of published essays, you know, a lot of the stories took place in the South. And um, it, it, it's very prescient, you know, her... her observations of, of, of working class and of racism and things that were going on, those were, even though that was in the 70s, you know, those would be the 
Trump supporters of, of, of now. So I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, when we talk, and as we as in her friends and over these dinners that we have, um, it, it, it's much more about um, just the insanity of what it is, but but uh, um, nothing that uh, we're not going to be able to read, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, here's one. Uh, does she have a sense of her own place in American literature? Does she, is she pleased with what she's done? Uh, what, what is her feeling about her own work? She would not admit what her place is or her legacy under threat of torture. Um, she must, you know. Um, it's not like she takes it for granted. It's just not something that she'd talk about or go on record. But, you know, when this um, movie premiered, it was at the New York Film Festival. And, um, you know, they put you, in the filmmaker, and Joan and I were in the box that's like high up at Alice Tully Hall. And when the movie finished, by tradition, they hit you with a spotlight. And it got a 10-minute standing ovation. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, that was for the culmination of her work. And there was no way she couldn't avoid seeing, wow, I got a fucking legacy. <laughs> and she was in a really good mood about it, too. <laughs> How long does this go on? <laughs> Anybody else? I think we're kind of getting close. I know that you said uh, the money sort of came and went and it took about six years to make, but how tough was it to get the film up? Uh, well, it was it was really like whistling in the dark for a long time. Um, I, I, quite honestly, I, I self financed it for the first uh, couple years, and uh, um, you know, when I I when I would go for money to various places, I would hear the same thing. Oh my God, she's a genius! Oh, I love her! I love her so much! No, you're not going to get any money. You know, it's about a writer. I'm going to see, they're picturing a doc with somebody sitting behind a typewriter. Um, so, you know, it was, it was uh, I, I have to tell you, though, I had, the, I had two terrors. One, knowing how much people love Joan and how, how much she means to so many people, how many people chart their lives by where they are in their lives by the stories that they read, that I would, you know, fuck up their interpretation of Joan. And two, that I would make half a Joan Didion movie and and not be able to finish it. I mean, it kept me awake at night. Um, so I'm so grateful I got to be able to do it and not just, you know, do it on the on the cheap, but, you know, when, when I got Netflix involved, um, you know, I got to pay for a music and a score and an editing room and a great editor and, 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 and make it in that was, you know, on a scale to which she deserved. So I'm going to leave it like that. Thank you so much. I am a lineman for the county.